You can download it from his site. You can download it from his site, and you'll just make sure you put it in in the correct folder, like you do with all your other stuff. So it has your driver lib there and your INC there, and it's called string compare. And you open it, and it open all these files. It has a main, right? This main is written C, and it will test it will test your exam, right? So it'll give you some sort of grade. Which is great. Right? <laughs> and so what I can do is I can go here, and I need to open this UR window, right? So that's going to be this, this button here, the serial window. If I open the serial window and I run my program, it'll tell me my score. And so right now I have a failing test. So you open the UART window, and initially it'll just start with a score of like zero, right? And it'll just say wrong, 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 wrong. And so what this will basically do is it'll tell you if your if your function is correct, right? If it passes that particular test case, it will tell you what your value was. And if your function happens to be wrong, so let's see if I, if I do something. If your function is wrong, it will tell you what wrong answer you produced and also what the correct answer should be, okay? And it's possible to finish this without getting 100, but generally it's like all or nothing, you know? So either you get 100 or you get a really, really low score. So make sure you're, uh, you're ready for that. See, so I got the first one correct, but the second one was wrong. And it says that my answer was negative one, the correct answer is one, and it doesn't give me any points for that. So if I finished like this, I would get a 75. And so the way it's going to happen is you'll fin you'll program, and at the end of the time, what you're going to do is we're going to come around and we'll check you out each individually. What we'll do is we'll just briefly look over your code to make sure that you actually wrote something instead of just outputting all zeros, because that might get you a larger score than zero. But we'll just, if we see it, we'll just give you a zero anyways. Um, and then we'll run it and record your score and we'll sign off. Right? And that's the score that you get, basically. Um, what will happen later on is that the professors or the, and the TAs will go over the, the ones that were not 100 later and assign partial credit, especially for the ones that are zeros, based on what you have. Okay. Any questions about that? So in the test, you can have your laptops open, and you can have Wi-Fi for the first 30 minutes to download everything and make sure everything's set up. But after that, if your Wi-Fi is on and we see it, uh, you may get kicked out. If, you, if another window is open other than like the calculator or Kyle or the file, we'll kick you out. Um, just don't cheat, right? Cool. Uh, they said there's no scratch paper, but that's like really useful for visualizing things. Can we like write on our tests? Yeah, there's no scratch paper, but you should write on your test and you should keep it organized because that can be part of your partial credit. No, you cannot bring scratch paper. How can we write something down for We will give you your test piece of paper. Yeah. More questions? All right. Okay. So what this exam is asking me to do is it has three parts. Okay. I've already written the code in here, so we're just going to go over why this code is. <coughs> All right. So 
The first question is to determine the length of an ASCII string. So all the questions will look like this. They'll have a header, which is the function name. It'll have a description of the function, input parameters, output parameters, error conditions, and in variables, right? So in this case, it says, uh, I cannot permanently modify, can you guys see that? R4 through R11, can you read the, the text, or is it too small? Okay. You can't permanently modify R4 to R11. That means that if you use registers 0, 1, 2, and 3 as per the ARM standard, you're fine. You don't have to push them, you don't have to pop them. In fact, doing that may cause some sort of error because you might have to return something in those 0, right? So be aware of that. And then it will give you the actual test cases that are used by the function for grading, okay? The actual test may not include those test cases. But for now, I think it will. And so typically, it'll actually look like this. It'll have something like this, and it'll just say, put your code here, right? which obviously means put your code where the comment is. Don't modify anything else. If you modify anything else, you're not responsible for what happens. So what I would recommend doing is during the test, if you finish a function and you get a grade for it, <coughs> save that, copy that folder over somewhere else, and just have it like have that copy on its own. Because in case you like screw something else up later on, you can still have a better grade if you have a working copy of this somewhere. Okay? Does that make sense? Do you want to understand what I'm saying? So kind of version control. Alright, so the first the first question tells me that I get a pointer to a null terminated string. Um, and I want to find the length of the string. All right. So this one's pretty easy, right? All I have to do is count until I get to the null character and return my value. So the first thing I do is I clear R2 because I know that I'm going to need R1 for my character. So R2 is actually going to be my counter here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to load R1 with the first character, and this is post-increment addressing. Right? So what it's going to do is the first time it's going to load R0, it's going to load the, the first character, and then it'll increment R0, right? So that the next time I'll get the next character. Does that make sense, everyone? Everyone understands post-increment addressing? All right, cool. And then CVZ, compare and branch hit zero, right? So I'm comparing R1 to zero. And if it's zero, I'm gonna go to the end. If not, I add one to R2, and then start my loop over. At the end, I move R2 to R0, and I return to my function. Everyone cool with that? What's the yeah, why don't you just do compare? Compare branch zero is equivalent to CMP R1, and then uh, the EQ. Oh, so it's just one thing, or one instruction? Yeah, it's compare and branch if zero. Okay. Yeah, can you go over the first uh, load? Yeah. Okay, so post increment loads. I'm going to write on this side. Okay. So basically, what happens is if I do an LDR, R1, R0, this is equivalent to me saying LDR, R1, R0, add R0. This is the same as this, okay? Does that make sense, everyone? This is not to be confused with, this is not, this is not logically equivalent to LDR, R1, R0, right? Don't get these two mixed up. If, it, if you're in doubt, just write out both instructions. There's no penalty for having long code. However, long code, the more lines you have, the more errors you can have, right? So one thing I would recommend doing for this test is really study your opcodes. Like go through, go through the back of the book, read every single one of those pages about every single instruction. Make sure you really absorb what it's telling you because that'll prevent you from making mistakes when you're writing your code. Okay, that will kill you on this test. You only have an hour and a half. It seems like a long time, but it's like writing your lab in an hour. Okay? So this is not the same as this. But this is something that you can you can easily make an error on. Do we have an hour and exam for something like this with like this exam? What? Do we have an hour and a half for like something like this? No, this is easy. This is like what is the time would, frame that this was? I would probably you should probably be able to do this in like forty five minutes. All right? 
And, I mean, the first one is relatively easy, right? You guys have done array traversal many, many times. So this is, this is a gimme. Generally, the first few functions will be pretty easy. So I would recommend knocking those ones out as fast as you can. Right? You should be able to do these very quickly, at least the first two. The last one is the one that will probably be a little more difficult. So does anyone have any questions about this? This makes sense? Okay, so the next one is compare. I'm going to compare two ASCII characters. R0 is the first, R1 is the second. Okay, just two characters. It tells me my output parameters. R1, if the first is greater than the second, or R1 is negative, negative 1 if the first is greater than the second, 0 if they're equal, positive 1 if less than one, right? And it gives you these test cases for clarification, right? So if it's a lowercase a versus a lowercase b, I'm going to get a positive 1. If it's a capital A and a lowercase b, I'm going to get a negative 1, right? Order does matter, right? The order in which the ask characters appear in R1 and R1, or R0 and R1 does matter. Right? That will affect the tables. So the way I did this was I did a simple subtraction. So I did R1, R0, or I did R1 minus R0, and I put it into R0. Okay, so what is that going to do? Right, it's going to subtract. So if B right, is greater than A, I'm going to get what? A positive, I'm going to get a positive number. Otherwise, I'm going to get a negative number. And if they're equal, I'm going to get a zero. So I've clearly handled the equal case, right? Does that make sense, everyone? So the subtraction handles the equal case. Then I have to handle what other two cases? I have to handle if it's, if it's positive, right? If I want a 1 returned in R0. And that case is when R1 is greater than R2, right? So that produces a positive number based on my subtraction. So I did sub s to set the condition code, and then move greater than is just me saying move r1. It's basically the equivalent of uh, dgt. Is it yeah. Yeah, that's a sign one, right? Well, less than a, sign. So this is a, it'll do a sign compare, right? And it'll say, if it's less than zero, right, skip it. Otherwise, move R1 into, uh, move one into R0. <coughs> okay? Does that make sense? And then here, I would just do a B. Let me, let me go back for a second. Does everyone understand this syntax when I do a move GT? Does everyone understand what that is? No. <laughs> so if you recall from the beginning of your book, in one of the first chapters, it states that opcodes can be, condi they can have conditions after them, right? <laughs> Any opcode can be conditioned. Does that ring a bell to anyone? So I can actually, instead of writing a branch instruction, right? So if I write a branch instruction, it could, it could make my code a lot more complicated than if I just write this, this instruction here. So this instruction, move GT, will only execute if, the, if it would branch on greater than. Does that make sense? Likewise, ASRLE will only branch if it's less than, right? <coughs> or less than equal. So ASR stands for arithmetic right shift. Right? So what am I doing here? So if it's positive, what is it going to do? It's going to move a 1 into R0, right? That handles our positive case, right? Where R1 is greater than R0. If, it's, if R0 is greater than R1, what's going, to ha what's going to be my value in R0? Is it going to be positive or negative? Negative, right? If R0 is greater than R1, subtracting a larger number from a smaller number gives me a negative number. Mm -hmm. So if this number is negative, what do I know about the sign bit? Well, you do it's one. 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 Yeah, one. the sign bit is a 1. So what can I do here? Since they're ASCII characters, I know they're 8 in length, and that the 8th eighth eighth bit is going to be a 1. So if I do an arithmetic shift, what happens? 
Arithmetic shift, when it shifts over, right, it sign extends, right? So what it'll do is it'll fill the registers with one, which becomes negative one, right? Couldn't you just do a move less than with negative one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that too. But that's actually slower. The move GT, it won't execute AS on the so, if it's greater than right, it's clearly not less than. These are opposites. So, so still, you're still using the same condition code that was set by Summers. Yeah. So what does it do after the move instruction? Use the jumps to so if it's greater than right, this instruction won't execute. It'll just jump back. So yeah. if it's greater than the move, oh, which it executes, if it's less than the yeah. arithmetic shift, right? Right, so this is, I guess what you would want to do here is you could do Does that make more sense? Let's make this easy. Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so what this does is if it's greater than, right, if it's greater than zero, which means that R1 is greater than R2, it moves a 1 in. Otherwise, it moves in a 0. Or actually, I also need a B here now. So how do we go with some of these opcodes you're putting correctly? Because normally an opcode, if it's written correctly, turns blue, but all those lump condition codes are, are still left black. Well, they're worse. <laughs> yeah. So that's why you don't rely on your compiler to tell you when you're doing things wrong, right? You rely on yourself to figure yeah. out if you're doing things wrong. It still won't compile. It may have a black opcode, yeah. but it's wrong. it'll. So if I write something like BGTA, right, what it'll do is it'll actually say unknown opcode, expecting opcode or a macro. So that's actually a good point because another thing is, look what happens if I move like put one space in front of a label. I get unknown opcode errors. Okay, white space is important. So make sure, don't rely on your compiler to tell you necessarily if things are working right with their with its colors or or that kind of stuff. Rely on your ability to actually debug the right codes right correctly. Right. So these these error messages will also give you sort of an idea. So I don't know if all of you know how to do this. I hope you do. But if you get an error message like this, uh, if you double click on it, it actually moves this little blue cursor to where your error is, the line that that error occurs. So if you write code and you get multiple errors, what you do is you go to the first error, the top error, and you double click that one, and you fix that error. Chances are that may fix several other errors below it, okay? So always, always fix your errors from the top, errors from the top to the bottom. And read the error message carefully. So you see that it says unknown opcode theme. So what that will do is that's saying basically, oh, it thinks that my FIN label is an opcode. So why would that be? Because it's not all the way to the left, right? Things that are all the way to the leftmost margin are labels. Otherwise, <laughs> they consider opcodes and operands. Okay? So let's see if this actually works now. Um, is there a particular Because so, so if you think about it, right, subtract is significantly faster to write, and it actually handles all of my cases better than a compare. So if I do a compare, how many compares do I have to do? I, I can do one, but it's not as clear as to what I'm doing, like what my result and my register is going to be. Yeah. 
But so like off the top of your head, how many of you know what the actual compare instruction does? It does a simple subtraction, right? But a lot of people get really confused when they do that. They are, they're not sure what, like if I write CMP, uh, CMP R0, R1, it's not immediately clear if it's R0 minus R1 or R1 minus R0, right? And so it might be a waste of your time to try to figure this out. Yeah, but it might be a waste of time in a test to figure that out. So yeah, if you re if you replace the uh, the subtraction with the compare, it's the same same instruction basically. So what score did we get? Seventy-five. Uh, so we got a, we got a score. We got the same score for that function. We got a seventy-five overall because I broke my last function, and I'm not sure how I broke it. But it's a one to the two. So. You can see that I got a 25 for the first function and a 50 cumulative for the next function. And it says all of these are correct. So you can see that the first two are weighted to be 25, 25, and the last one is 50, right? So that indicates to me that the last one is going to be probably twice as long or twice as hard as any of the other two functions I just did. But those two are relatively easy. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about the previous one? Hmm? Um, yeah. So, yeah. just to be clear on exactly what's going on in that, what? It's just coding. Yeah, it's pretty much going to be just coding. Uh, so, essentially, you're just comparing R1 and R0. If R0 is greater than 0, you place R1. Remember, so this question may be ambiguous. You will also get an ASCII table, okay? Remember that all ASCII characters are actually numbers, or hex values? Yep. And so a good way to debug this would to be if, for whatever reason, you're not getting the proper output, is actually debug and look at the values in your registers. Are things happening as you think they are going to be? Are your, in your PSR, are the flags getting set that you think they are, the, the proper flags that are getting set? But uh, let's go ahead and look at string compare. So string compare, right, what it's going to do is compare two ASCII strings of varying length. One can be larger than the other, or one can be longer than the other. Um, and it's going to return a zero if they're both exactly the same, right? That's obviously the simplest case. It's going to return a one if the first string is greater than, is al comes alphabetically before the second, and a negative one if the first string after the second one. Okay? So this the first letter is like the same, we have to look at the second letter. Yeah, so if the first letter, right, so if the first letter is the same, we move to the next letter. If the next letter is not the same, we can basically return the value that my compare function calls, right? Does that make sense, everyone? So, does everyone understand how, so the way these tests are formatted is that the above two functions should help you complete the third function, right? Or each function may build on each other. That's why it's important to make your functions safe. They don't, you don't necessarily have to call your own functions, but they will make your life easier if you do them correctly. Especially when you put like a push. Oh yeah, you push. Yeah. So for this one, I'm gonna need to use R4 and R5 <coughs> if I make a function call, right? Because I have to save my R0 and my R1, yeah? Does that make sense? Because any any other function I wrote in this program uses R0 or R1. Okay, so the first thing I do is I push those in the link register. Um, some of you may be familiar with this from the last lab. This is a different syntax that Balbano also uses and that you can use, but you can actually push the link register and then pop it directly into the PC. And that'll take you to, that's the same as doing a VXLR. All right, does that make sense? So that's what that syntax here is. And you guys have seen that in your labs. So the first thing I do is I push it, and then I, I save R0 to R4 and R1 to R5. Okay, that makes sense? And then I do my post increment reads. So simple. I read the first character from both strings and I post increment. 
everyone so following? Okay, so I compare R0 to 0. So that checks for the end condition of the first string, which I call empty one. Right? So if the first string so if the first string is empty, what do I do? I go and I see if the second string is empty. Right? Because this is my simple case. That I have two empty strings immediately, right off the bat. So they're both the same. Right? So actually what I do is I compare R1 to 0. If that's the case, then they're the same. And I branch the same. So I move 0 to R R0, and I'm done. Does that make sense? Okay, so what's my next case? That my first string isn't empty, but my second string is empty. All right? So what does that mean? Yeah, they're not equal. But what, which one comes first? Which is alphabetically first? That means that the first one comes or wait, the empty this, one come first? The first one. Yeah, so I return a negative one. So the empty one comes first? Yes. Yeah, yeah one. how do you treat an empty one? Yeah, do, do yeah so an empty one comes first, right? Because in an alphabet, if you have a lack of characters, <coughs> so cat comes before cattle, right? Okay. So an empty string will be considered first in this case. Would that be a possible question that we could ask? The, like, if, yeah, like, that's a possible question. So in that case, right, I just move in negative one because the first string is non-empty, but the second string is empty. So the second string comes first. Negative one, I'm done. And now let's look at the other case that I, I did for my, my first one. If the first string is empty, but the second string is not empty, right, immediately I know that the first string comes first, so I move a one in, and I'm done. So these are really all my base cases, right? These are easy cases. Does everyone understand that? So anytime I have a multi I have a multi case problem like this where I have to re return different things, what I want to do is I want to break it up into all its separate cases, right? Figure out how I'm going to handle those in the in the best way possible. How I'm going to organize this, and I want to handle the base cases first, right? The simple cases, the corner cases, and then I go and I do the general case. That's the best way to approach one of these problems. So I basically write all all these code all that code first, and then what I'm going to do here is if both of, then I do if both of them have data, right? So if both of them have data, what do I do? Since I have the first characters of each one in R1 and R0, I call BL compare, right? What does that return? They're equal. Yeah, it returns if they're equal or not. If they're not equal, right, what happens? I'm done, and I can just return the value I got in R0, right? Because that will tell me which alphabetically comes first. So what I do is I compare if they're equal, right? So if in R0 I get a 0, then that means that I have to compare the next character, right? Does that make sense, everyone? Because that means the two characters I just put in, in R1 and R0, are identical. So I have to look at the next character to figure out if it's done. So I go up here and I reload my, my thing, and I go through the loop again. Otherwise, what happens is it falls through this loop and I'm done, right? Because the two characters are different, and my compare function handles which one comes alphabetically. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions? So all of these problems are different in exactly what they want you to do, but all of them are, for the most part, the same in how they're going to structure the problem. Right? You're going to have two or three functions, maybe even like four, that are, are pretty short. They're like auxiliary functions that help you build up to the final question. And in your final question, I would probably expect to use any function. I would expect to call any of the functions that I made, right? So they give you sort of hints on how to complete the problem. Any questions about that? So now if I run this. Um, also, there was something about leaving early. I think that for now, the rule is that you have to stay the entire duration of the test, which is a pain in the ass. So we kind of talked to them about it, and uh, certain teachers may have different rules on that. Okay. But for now, assume that you will not be getting out early, even if you finish early. So take your time. There you go, 100. So questions? We also have, I also did another one. Can you surf after we're done? Can you surf after you're done? The internet? 
Um, that was also another question, and the answer to that would be no. Because it would be distracting to other people. Again, no. Bring a book. For two hours. Expect, expect to just not have, be able to do anything. It's bring a book or bring, long, bring paper home. It's only an hour long, though. Uh, the entire duration is like two hours. I would, I would assume that the teachers will probably let you out early, um, especially if you're in the fifth floor lab because there's a lot of space there. But what they don't want is to be like in a classroom, right, and have someone finish early and have to like bump everyone's laptop. 